Welcome to the Equipping You in Grace podcast, hosted by Dave Jenkins. The Equipping You in Grace podcast is a podcast about helping Christians develop a biblical worldview in a conversational tone about issues inside and outside the church. Now, for today's episode, let's join our host, Dave Jenkins. Well, welcome back to the Equip You and Grace podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm the host for this show. And on today's episode, we're going to continue our series talking about contentment. Uh, Today, zeroing in on contentment and discouragement. You know, from time to time over the centuries, some Christians have taught, sometimes with very tragic consequences, that a truly spiritual person will never get discouraged. To be cast down, by definition, according to them, is to be unspiritual. You know, unless we're well grounded, though, in the Word of God, it is very easy for us to be overwhelmed, confused, and even more discouraged by such teaching. In fact, this teaching, it seems logical, right? If the gospel saves us, it must save us from discouragement. And it also appears to be wonderfully spiritual. After all, are we not more than conquerors through him who loved us, according to Romans 8.37? But this is not biblical logic, nor is it true biblical spirituality. The gospel saves us from death, not by removing death, but by helping us to face death in the power of Christ's victory and thus to overcome it. And so too with sin and similarly with discouragement. Now, you see, faith in Christ does not remove all the causes of discouragement. Rather, it enables us to overcome them. We may experience discouragement, but we're not to be defeated by discouragement. And nor is this the biblical spirituality. It is false super spirituality that ignores or even denies the reality of our humanity. We live in frail flesh and blood and in a fallen world, which John says in 1 John 5, 19, lies in the power of the evil one. And there's much to discourage us, right? Jesus knew this. To be free from the possibility of discouragement will be more spiritual than Jesus and therefore not truly spiritual at all. In fact, even Psalm 42 and 43 teach us the biblical approach to discouragement. We feel it, we recognize it for what it is, and we start to analyze the reasons for its presence. Disappointment often reveals what your heart is really worshiping. It exposes you. If your son made a bad decision, are you sad because of his foolish decision or because it shows he's not living up to your expectations? In fact, if you desire more intimacy with your spouse, but he or she doesn't um, doesn't go along with it, are you dissatisfied because of your spouse's no or because you feel entitled to more intimacy? If your boss doesn't give you the promotion, are you frustrated because you worked hard for that pay raise or because you fear failure? And when you deal with that disappointment, it's too easy to focus on the circumstances around you and even cast blame on others than looking at your own heart. Now, I want you to think for a moment about the last time you were disappointed. Was the bulk of your thinking and energy focused on the wrong done, the unhelpful circumstances, or on your own heart? The natural tendency to sin is to blame others and not to deal honestly with our hearts. And so please ask the Lord to help you, to show you your selfish tendencies of your own heart. Why do things not go as we expect? Well, in one word, it's because of our sin. Sin corrupts everything in our world and leaves us sad, confused, regretful, and even disenchanted, right? Hollywood, best-selling books, television commercials, even Disney, they all work against us to feed our desires that give us unrealistic, idealistic expectations. If you naively expect things to go well and even downplay the power of sinful flesh, You're not being realistic about your sin. You're likely to be disappointed. But if you demonstrate sober judgment, according to Romans 12, 3, a humble perspective on yourself, even a realistic view of your sin, you're less prone to be disappointed. Our lives run into real world with real problems, with real frustrations and real heartache. And we acknowledge what we knew all along. Sin ruins everything. And yet the spirit is powerfully working within you, dear Christian, but your flesh is doing everything it can to undermine your real true life in Christ. 
So what do you do when you're disappointed? Do you hold a pity party? Do you complain about it? Do you grumble about it? Do you mope about it? Uh, get angry, muddle through confusion, tur- turn on yourself, manipulate, withdraw, fix the problem, make the problem go away. None of those responses are Christian at all. The smartest thing a Christian can do is to turn to Christ and start with a few simple words in prayer. Help. Jesus, I can't deal with this on my own. I need you. Where you turn with your disappointment is key. Do you turn to Christ or do you sort through this on your own? Do you turn to Christ or do you cast the blame on your circumstances? Do you turn to Christ or do you blame the Lord? Do you think that since he's sovereign, everything that doesn't work out for you is his fault? Dear Christian, don't you see that your disappointment, your brokenness could be clearing away the clutter of your life that's keeping you from seeing Christ himself? Turn to Christ and give your disappointment to the Lord. You know, you, you are you struggling today because your hopes, your dreams, your expectations have not worked out? Run to the cross. Let Christ comfort you and offer a kind of satisfaction that can only be found in the Lord. In the shadow of the cross, your disappointment can be de- dealt with honestly and real. You know, you might face a really hard situation and you might have got really hard news. And, and, and what you need to understand is that in light of that hard news, you need to hear today that as long as we live on this side of glory, sin is going to make a mess of our lives. And so when things go wrong, our vantage point can be narrowed to the tiny kingdom of ourselves, and we can't see beyond our disappointment. We get fixated on the horizontal, the anger, the pain, the confusion, the disappointment, and we even lose sight of the vertical, our relationship with God. But God is saying to us, dear child, look up and see. It's not always going to be this way. One day, sin and pain are going to be no more. And now when you're disappointed, you need to look up. You need to look beyond the confines of your circumstances and remember heaven. As Psalm 73, 24 through 26 says, don't lose sight of eternity. In heaven, there's going to be no more disappointment because you're going to be with God himself. What a glorious promise and place heaven truly is. In fact, just when you're about to finish one of the letters from the Apostle Paul, he hits you between the eyes with a one-liner that tells you how well he understands you and your Christian life. Have you ever experienced this? Take 2 Corinthians 3.13. Do not grow weary in doing good. Paul and the Thessalonians were facing hard times. They were experiencing affliction. Paul knew how easy suffering can wear believers down, almost to the point of losing heart, as Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 16. And perhaps you know that feeling, disappointment, opposition to your faith at home or work, illness, personal loss, they, these can all wear you down. So what is it that prevents us from growing weary and well-doing? How does knowing God and his ways are perfect and holy and just, how does that make a difference? Well, let's talk through this. Psalm 119, 67 and 71 make clear that sometimes God leads us through affliction in order to refocus our gaze on the Lord. John 15, 12 teaches us about this, that at other times the Lord is pruning us so that we may bear even more fruit for his honor and glory. 2 Corinthians 4, 10 through 12 is helping us as well to understand that he may order trials in our lives to touch others through us. And in the case of Job and in the mystery of his providence, he sometimes wants to show us his grace and glory in us in the midst of our trials. And then in every situation, he is working as a great Presbyterian pastor, Samuel Ruford used to say, to polish our graces and to make us more like Jesus, according to Romans 8, 29. Now, you see, we do not always see immediately what the Lord's purpose is, but we know this, the truth of Psalm 1830. This God, his way is perfect. Now, when we approach this conversation about discouragement uh, with contentment, what we see is that Paul, you know, he faced a tremendous amount of situations Uh, as 2 Corinthians 12, which we looked at previously. He says this in Philippians 4.11, though, I have learned in light of what he talks about in 2 Corinthians 12, 
He says he learned in Philippians 4.11, in whatever situation I am, to be content. Uh, just take a look at Paul's letters, and what you see is the more the Lord continues to refine my and your incomplete notions of contentment. Paul is not carefree; he's not unburdened. He, he's surrounded by trouble, nor is he surrounded by trouble-free relationships. In fact, considering the larger picture of Paul's ministry, it, it, it will give us a fuller picture of what contentment is by gaining insight into what it's not. See, contentment is not a carefree existence. Contentment isn't having it all together and finding a perfect balance between work and play, nor is it just some idyllic moment spent swinging on a hammock, sip, sipping sweet tea, reading a book on a cool afternoon while all the world around you falls apart. Paul is describing his time in Asia probably wouldn't make the Facebook feed in 2 Corinthians 1.8 when he says, for we do not want you to be ignorant, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Burdened, afflicted, despairing. These are descriptions and, and they're not in opposition to a contented soul. Second, contentment is not the absence of relational conflicts and anguish. Now, you see, Paul had his share of relational disagreements. In fact, even departing from Barnabas over dispute regarding Mark in Acts 15, 39. And yet, in the midst of deep affection, ministry included relational anguish, as he writes in 2 Corinthians 2, 4. For I wrote to you out of much affliction and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love that I have for you. You see, loving others means our hearts will be burdened for them. Now, contentment is not an indifferent disposition towards others. Instead, we should expect that the depth of our love for one another will involve many tears and even anguish of heart. Third, contentment is not a life without longing and groaning and distress. You see, when we mistakenly view contentment as a, as a positive uh, attitude all the time, we miss entering more deeply into relationship with Jesus. You see, Jesus was troubled in soul on the eve of his crucifixion, and in agony, he prayed multiple times to the Father for rescue. Paul described his own experience with similar distress in 2 Corinthians 5, 2. For in this tent, we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. Contentment does not mean that we're free from desires, longings, or even heart-wrenching circumstances. Crying out to God for relief is not in opposition to contentment. Fourth, contentment is not freedom from fear and anxiety. Paul explained the state of his circumstances and turmoil in very uh, stark details in 2 Corinthians 7, 5 when he said this, for even when we came into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were afflicted at every turn, fighting without and fear within. And in 2 Corinthians 11, 24 and 25, he says this, Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night and hunger and thirst often without food and cold and exposure and apart from other things there is the daily pressure on me he says of my anxiety for all the churches now paul also faced outward danger and inward anxiety now he's not hiding his struggles both physical and emotional rather he shared his weakness his hardship his burdens that he might glory all the more in the strength of christ according to second corinthians 4 7 Fifth, contentment is not freedom from the fight against sin. Paul was not free of sin. He hated his sinful choices and struggled against them. Romans 7.15 says, For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. See, Paul fought the good fight, and that fight was not easy. The Christian life is described as a race, a battle, and childbirth. Each of these denotes an active, even a painful struggle, not to easily walk in the park. Fighting diligently against sin is not in opposition to contentment. And now, in the midst of fears, difficult circumstances, battles against sin, Paul still claimed to be content in all things. 
And if contentment isn't some of the things we usually think of it to be, what does it look like? Well, Jeremiah 17, 7 through 8 says this, Blessed is a man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when he comes, for its leaves remain green, and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. And in the year of drought, the tree planted by the stream, it continues to bear fruit. Contentment is not the fruit of perfect circumstances or a calm constitution. It's the result of trusting in the Lord. Now, we, we, we need to understand this because Paul faced fear, anxiety, physical dangers, ministry difficulties, like we all do. And yet he faced these struggles prayerfully with a deep assurance in the goodness of God. Now, the reality of Paul's spiritual situation, it proved greater than his earthly experience. And from the spring of heavenly riches, Paul lived a life of earthly contentment. Romans 8 provides a window into the truths that brought Paul peace in the midst of various trials. First, Paul rejoiced that his heavenly situation was secure. Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Second, Paul set his mind on spiritual matters. Romans 8, 6 says, For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. Third, Paul understood that nothing could happen to him except that which was ultimately for his good. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Fourth, Paul knew that God was for him. Romans 8, 31 through 32 says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Fifth, Paul trusted in the one relationship that would never fail. Romans 8, 38 and 39 says this, For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, you see, in the midst of life's twists and turns, the good news remains constant. We're not condemned. The Spirit lives within us. God works all things for our good. He is for us. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ our Lord. Our world, our imaginations are going to continue to put forward an impossible dream of a carefree life. And if we chase after a mirage of contentment, we're never, ever going to find it. And however, by trusting in Christ, we find refreshment for our souls in the midst of hardship, in the midst of difficulties, in the midst of trials. As Charles Spurgeon said, if Christ were only a cistern, we might soon exhaust his fullness. But who can drain a fountain? You see, from the spring of heavenly riches, true contentment flows. And that is how we address contentment in our lives. We remind ourselves. We remind ourselves of who Christ is, of what Christ has done. And we then remind others of what Christ has done, who he is, what he's done, what he continues to do on our behalf. But we first need to take our own, we take ourselves by the hand and remember, remember Christ, remember his goodness, remember his greatness, remember his majesty, remember how he helps you, remember the help that God has given to you. Remember, Israel was told to remember Remember what the Exodus was. Remember the salvation of the Lord that and what he did. Remember. And the same is true today with us in our walk with God. We need to remember. We need to remember what God has done. And most importantly, we need to remember what Christ has done in his death, burial, and resurrection. But we need to also remember what God providentially has, has done in our lives, how he provided for us in various situations, we, we, and how he's continued to work through various situations. You know, I, I shared in, in one episode recently, you know, how I, I become the durable power of attorney for my mom. And it's just, as I look out at this situation, friends, I, I just want to say this with full honesty, that, you know, I, I'm sitting here, I pray, and I'm just asking the Lord, Lord, would you providentially work as you only can 
to to give me wisdom and and even go before me in in conversations with other people would you providentially work in this situation to make this situation uh, uh have have a good resolution because there's so much mess and maybe as you look out at your life today friend you look at it and you see nothing but disaster nothing but situation after situation and so I want to I want to I want to appeal to you today to do what I'm doing in the midst of this season of my life. I'm just praying and asking the Lord, Lord, I need your help. I need your wisdom. I need your guidance. Would you providentially, uh, as as you are working through these various people that I'm talking to, would you would you work through them? Would you would you prepare the way? Would you would you work uh, uh, with the, the various people? that I have to talk to so that so that there there can be smoothness and and that we can get things in in line and order would you would you send me to the people lord as i call these places would you help me to have conversations with people that are actually going to help me so that 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 we can move forward and and there's nothing wrong with praying this it's all it's all in the sovereign plan of god every circumstance as one of my mentors used to say is hand tailored by god there's not one ounce as we'll talk about in another episode down the road here soon there's not one instance there's not one situation that is out of the hands of god he is sovereign over all he is orchestrating sovereignly uh, all of history from the beginning the middle to the end and everywhere in between and that is actually an amazing truth it means that god has come near to us in christ and it means also that our lord is unchanging and so we can trust him and so i just want to i want to leave you with that thought today that in the midst of your discouragement god is working and john piper used to say that god is doing a, a thousand things that we might see one and and he's not limiting it just to one thousand by the way it's really the number is infinite god is doing an infinite number of things and we may get a glimpse at a, a picture if you will of just a few of of how the lord is sovereignly working we might get some encouragement that's very specific and and very helpful and and that's when you need to turn that offering that encouragement back up to the lord and say lord i'm so thankful for this encouragement uh, but you get all the honor and the glory this is why we when we get encouragement we thank the person specifically thank you for that encouragement it, it really helped me uh, and we can say this is why uh, but i i also just want to say to you i'm giving all the glory to the lord because it is his work in us and through us well, guys, I want to thank you for listening or watching this episode of the Equip You and Grace podcast. Until next week, may the Lord richly bless you and keep you. Thank you for listening to the Equipping You and Grace podcast. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe, rate us on the app, and share this with your friends and family on social media. If you want to find us on social media, you can find us on Twitter at Servants of Grace, on Instagram at Servants of Grace, or by searching at Servants of Grace on Facebook. You can also find this episode and many others like it on the front page of our website, servantsofgrace.org.